Thank you, Andrew. Sermon title today is Faith That Moves Mountains. Uh, the story is told of a farmer who was out driving his tractor one day and he rolled over a stretch of gopher mounds and the earth kind of crumbled beneath one of the tires and the tractor rolled over on its side and threw him off. Well, fortunately, he escaped with just some minor injuries, and he trudged back to the farmhouse and told his wife about the, the mishap, and upon hearing about the accident, she fervently remarked to him, well, honey, you know the Lord was really with you through all of that. And the farmer, thinking about his bruises and considering his misfortune, answered, well, if he was with me, he sure got a rough ride. The reality of that farmer's statement is repeated many times over in our lives as well. As we seek to live out our faith in our everyday lives, uh, we often fall into various misfortunes and we give God a, a bumpy ride as he goes along with us as well. Uh, fortune, uh, 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 frequently uh, that ride is made uh, rougher because we fail to walk in faith and we try to do things in our own strength. And that uh, brings to mind this passage that we're looking at here this morning in this uh, uh, series on unfiltered Jesus as we look at one of the hard sayings of Jesus recorded for us in 23 and 24. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. On two separate occasions, Jesus declared this incredible mountain-moving power was available to those of us who would exercise our faith in him. Now, if it had occurred only one time in the scripture, it would still be authoritative, it would still be reliable, but the fact that twice, both in Matthew's gospel and Matthew chapter 21 and in Luke 11 here, it heightens the significance of this promise for all of us. It is an awesome, life-changing moment when we realize that God has promised to us supernatural power as we follow him and as we trust in him. So what are we to make of this difficult statement of Jesus? First, I think it's well for us to note the context in which his statement was made. Earlier in chapter 11, right before the passage that Andrew just read for us, we have the story of Jesus' triumphant entry into the city of Jerusalem in the events that we commonly know as Palm Sunday. And there the gospel writer Mark notes that after those events of Jesus going through the streets of Jerusalem and the crowd uh, laying down uh, palm branches and, and, and shouting Hosanna uh, to the son of David, uh, that the next morning as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. And he saw a fig tree in the distance that had leaves. And uh, so he thought, well, I'm going to go and see if there's some figs there because I'm hungry. And when he came to the fig tree, he found nothing but leaves. And then the scripture says, for it was not the season uh, for the figs. Now that seems a bit weird when Jesus then says, okay, may nobody ever eat figs from you again. Like, well, wait a minute. It, it would be a little bit, we're thinking, like expecting apples on an apple tree at this time of the year. It's not the time for them yet, you know. But that's not really as capricious and uh, unrestrained a comment as we might think because fig trees do not have leaves without also having figs. Fig trees, I understand, tend to go into a dormant state. There is no leaves there. And then the leaves come out. And at that time, also figs begin to uh, uh, appear. So here was a tree, though, that had leaves so it should have had figs, but it did not. And uh, it gave kind of like a false advertising. It was saying to people, oh, there's figs here in this tree. But when you got there, there were no figs. Uh, kind of a picture of false advertising. And it's interesting to note that in all of the miraculous works of Jesus, this is the only destructive miracle that you will find, where he does something miraculous but it is in a destructive manner. And so for him to do that, there's probably a, something we ought to check out here. There's a message behind all of this. And I think it is this, that God doesn't approve 
with our confession without also living up to that. God doesn't approve when we're all talk and no walk. And he's saying, when you are a follower of Christ, when you say, I'm a Christian, there ought to be accompanying works that demonstrate that you live what you say you are. And so he's really, I think, underscoring his displeasure with fake profession. And then that event was followed by his cleansing of the temple in verses 15 to 18. And once again, here we see kind of a rare reaction of Jesus. Uh, you know, people kind of think of Jesus meek and mild, but here he goes into the temple and he turns everything upside down. Uh, and I think he, he, he angrily responds to this uh, whole event because he was upset with the money changers who were not, in this case, involved with fake profession, but with fake worship. You see, there were charlatans and profiteers that were in cahoots with the priests of that day, and they were fleecing Jewish pilgrims who came into the holy city for, at this particular time, forcing them to purchase approved sacrificial animals, but they raised up the price on that, and they also price gouged for uh, their currency transfer. You see, every uh, Jewish male had to pay a yearly temple tax. It was about the amount that one would make in maybe two days. And they had to pay it in the temple currency, not the regular currency. And so these money changers would be there taking the regular Jewish uh, currency and they would then turn it into the temple currency. And the reason the temple sought to have a different currency was that they were uh, using the uh, Tyranian uh, currency, which had a lot more silver in it than did the Jewish money. And so they had to change the money over. When my wife and I were in Israel back in 1984, uh, we uh, uh, had flown into Jordan and then went and spent uh, 10 days in Israel and then came back and spent a couple more days in Jordan. And uh, during the time that we were in Israel, uh, we had a, a, a Arab uh, tour company and an Arab guide, and so we ate a lot of Arab meals, okay, more so than Jewish meals. And uh, by the time we had gotten uh, back into Jordan, we were pretty well all pitaed out with a lot of pita bread and dips and all that kind of thing. And there was a, uh, uh, a American hotel, I'm not sure anymore what it was, was it a Marriott or a, a Sheridan that was across the street from where we were staying. And uh, we all thought, oh man, I, I, we could eat a good uh, banana split, you know. And so after dinner that night, another couple and us walked over to the hotel and uh, decided we would get a banana split and uh, Barbie and I would get one and split it and they did the same thing. And so we went to pay. We had the uh, uh, Isra Israeli shekel and we had American dollars. And so we tried the shekels and they didn't want them. And so we tried our American dollars and they didn't want them either. And they said, before you can purchase, you need to go down to the, the lobby and talk to the money changer and get it in deniers because the denier was worth more money than uh, either the shekel or the American dollar. And it was that kind of a thing that was going on here at the temple. So when people would try to pay that temple tax, uh, they had to have their money changed over from the regular Jewish uh, currency into the uh, Tyranian currency. And so as Jesus walked in there and saw all of this happening, while these men were kind of uh, acting very pious, like they were really doing a, a favor for these people, Jesus saw that they were being taken advantage of, and they reaped the wrath of Jesus upon themselves as he invoked the Old Testament scripture where we read, and he said to them, is it not written, my house shall be hall, called a house of prayer for all nations, but you've made it a den of robbers. So that's kind of the setting then in which this, this, uh, unfiltered promise of Jesus is given. Because beginning then at verse 20, the narrative returns back to the fig tree. Uh, Peter notices that that fig tree that Jesus had cursed the day before was now withered from its roots. And he said, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed is withered. And Jesus answered, have faith in God. Truly I tell you, 
If anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. My first observation with this promise of our Lord is that we need to understand that Jesus is using a physical illustration to communicate a spiritual truth. Jesus had just re uh, uh, addressed the rebellion of Israel and their refusal to embrace the kingdom of God uh, and that instead of really accepting and understanding the kingdom, they were guilty of fake profession and fake worship. And we do well to understand that this incredible promise of moving mountains occurs in the midst of that context then of profession and purity and prayer. What Jesus was trying to get across to his followers here, I think, is the spiritual nature of the kingdom of God. And he uses it by, uh, uses this earthly illustration to help us further understand the nature of the kingdom. Throughout his earthly ministry, Jesus had encountered many who thought that he had come to be a political or a military leader. And he kept reminding them, no, my kingdom is not of the, this world. This is a spiritual kingdom. And here on the heels of the triumphant entry into the holy city, those sentiments by those folks was probably heightened and, and it escalated. And they're thinking, yes, everybody's now, you know, gathering around Jesus. He's going to rise to power and overthrow the Roman government. And we're going to be free once again. And so Jesus here again is reminding them that his kingdom is not of this world. So what are we to make then of this wide sweeping promise? There he says that if you say to the mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, you can get it done. All you need to do is believe. I think what we need to understand is that as you look through the scriptures here, there's not an account of any of the apostles ever saying to a mountain, go move, where you had total, you know, excavation done just like that, you know? Uh, I, I think we need to understand that. And again, if we refer back to the scripture that we looked at two weeks ago, there's never a case where we actually saw that a camel moved through the eye of a needle. So Jesus is using hyperbole here. He's trying to, to kind of overstate things to give us a visual picture uh, of what he is wanting us to understand about exercising mountain-moving faith. The commentator L.A. Stauffer puts it this way, casting mountains into the sea is not a specific objective of the will of God or Christ. But it does illustrate vividly and memorably the unlimited power of God when working through those who believe and do not doubt. Furthermore, I think we need to understand that in our Lord's teaching here, this is not an endorsement of the modern day heretical teaching commonly known as name it and claim it. You see, God is not our cosmic bellhop. Or he's not some sacred Santa Claus that all we need to do is give him our wish list and everything comes true. It doesn't mean that if we place our faith in God that you can get whatever your little heart desires. This is not an open-ended, carte blanche statement that Jesus is making here. And I think there have been those who have purported and, and have uh, uh, used this particular idea of Christianity uh, that have done irreparable harm to the Christian witness because they promote this idea that if you just have enough faith, you will be prosperous. If you just have enough faith, you will be healed. If you just have enough faith, you will be successful. That's the one side of the spectrum here. Now, the other side of that is those believers in Christ who look at this and say, well, now that's, that's just ridiculous. That's so outlandish, I, I don't believe that you can, you know, have that kind of faith. And so they try to get along with their own meager, finite resources. Remember what I was saying here is that Jesus is using these events, he's using his teaching to point out the spiritual nature of the kingdom of God. And I believe there are many believers that miss out on God's best for their lives because they are fearful of stepping out in faith and claiming God's best 
and his promises and his power. Randy Alcorn, in his insightful book, Lord Falgram's Letter, uh, which are inspired by the scoop tape letters of C.S. Lewis, applies uh, those same kinds of concepts. And in Alcorn's book, he has uh, Lord Falgren uh, writing these words to a uh, uh, inferior, a, a subordinate uh, demon called Squaltate. And this is what he says to Squaltate. Consider whom you are dealing with. Now he's talking about trying to uh, influence human beings. He says, consider who you are dealing with here. The virus of the galaxy, these parasites called image bearers, they are so ignorant that they imagine the cosmos is limited to what they see, they hear, they taste, they touch, and smell. The rest of the universe, 99.99% of all reality, in their puny little minds just doesn't exist. They're like those slimy babies in their vermin mother's womb, never suspecting there's a vast world beyond the realm of their senses. In a overstated way, what Alcorn is, is pointing out is what we are dealing with day to day is much bigger than what we just can see and touch and feel and understand with our own eyes. You know, there's a spiritual realm out there that is very real and we are doing battle in that spiritual realm as the Apostle Paul notes in Ephesians chapter 6. We need to recognize the spiritual reality of the unseen principles that govern the kingdom of God. And we need to realize that those unseen uh, forces are working against us as we seek to live a life of faith. The Apostle Paul exhorted the saints of God to follow his example in this regard in 2 Corinthians 4.18 when he says, We fix our eyes on what is unseen because what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Now that can be a real challenge to us in our scientific world in which we live today. We think we have it all figured out. We can put everything through the scientific method. We, we have tests and we have uh, all kinds of ways in which we uh, try to understand the world in which we live. And we think we have it pretty well figured out at times. But you see, even that which we know to be the physical realm in which we live is so much beyond our puny minds and, and understanding. For example, the Earth travels around on its own axis at a thousand miles an hour. So folks, we're moving at a thousand miles an hour right now. The sun, it moves around the sun at 67,000 miles per hour. And we zoom through the galaxy at an astonishing speed of 481 miles, thousand miles per hour. Yet it seems like we're standing still right now. And Jesus uses this terminology of moving mountains to elevate our perception beyond the finite limits of time and space so that we will begin to understand the infinite God who wants to unleash his supernatural powers in our midst. Uh, one of my favorite golfing stories addresses the desire for this kind of supernatural uh, natural power that's spoken about here in Mark 11. The story is told of a young fellow who moved from the Middle East to Scotland, and since Scotland was the birthplace of golf, the man decided he'd try the game, and in reality, he wasn't very good. In fact, he was terrible. He, he actually made the duffers and the weekend hackers look like Tiger Woods. And so he was playing one day, and on, on this beautiful ocean course, he hit his ball off the fairway, went down over a cliff, and landed on the beach below. Determined he wasn't going to take a penalty for that uh, stroke and the fact that he was down to his last ball in his bag, he climbed down the cliff and thought he would hit the ball from the beach. And so uh, he got down there to the beach and he discovered there was a genie lamp covered with seaweed laying right next to his ball. And he, you know, uncovered the, uh, uh, the seaweed off the genie lamp and uh, uh, this genie appeared and uh, said, your wish is my command. The man said, wow. Well, I wish for peace in my homeland. And the genie said, well, where are you from? 
The man pulled out a small map from his wallet and he showed the genie a small town near Jerusalem. And the genie said, well, now let's be realistic. The Middle East has been a place of turmoil and war for thousands of years. And do you think a genie covered with seaweed in the coast of Scotland can somehow come up and make that wish come true? That's not going to happen. Uh, make another wish. <laughs> so the man said, well, I'd like to become a professional golfer. The genie said, well, that's more like it. Take a practice swing and I'll tell you how to improve. And so the man took his swing and the genie looked at it and he said, let me see that map one more time. If the promise of mountain moving power seems too good to be true, we need to take another look at the map, this map, God's word. You see, the one who is making these fantastic promises here is not a magic genie. He is the majestic God of the universe who desires to demonstrate his awesome power in our lives. We need to embrace the possibility that God's supernatural activity did not end at the cross or end when he ascended, Jesus ascended into heaven. But we need to heed the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans 8.32 when he wrote, He did not spare his own son, but graciously gave him up for all things. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things give us all things you see faith is a gift of God and it's imp an important truth that I think many Christians overlook for in Romans 12 3 we read this for by the grace given me I say to every one of you do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith that God has given to you. Our faith is a gift of God. And what Paul is trying to say to us here in Romans 12 is that we already have all the faith that we need for any given situation that we might be facing in life. And if at a later time we need more faith, God will give it to us. God has, has amazed me over and over again because he is such a marvelous uh, economist. Uh, he, he doesn't waste his resources uh, by just giving them out willy-nilly. Faith is not something that you store up uh, like in a, a tube of toothpaste and when you need it you squeeze it out and then you use it. It's not like being salt in a salt shaker that you shake it out when the condition, conditions of your life demand a response of faith. God unleashes his gift of faith in our lives as we need it and if we need more, he will supply it. And that's critical then for us to understand that. The real issue here then is not do we have enough faith, but are we availing ourselves of the faith that God already has given to us, and are we acting upon the faith that we possess? You see, it's not of the nature of faith that God provides our needs um, stingily or sparingly he gives us all that we need and it's not something we earn it's something that when we are in a position to need that faith God provides it for it for us and I think we're often a little bit like the Israelites as they faced Goliath we focus on the size of the problem rather than the empowerment of God and we have that attitude then that uh, uh, we're trapped into this kind of short-sighted vision. Uh, uh, we don't really have a sense of how powerful God really is. And the only way we really grow in our faith is by adversity and by difficulty. You look back over your life, and I would suspect that the growing times of your spiritual life have been those times where you've gone through difficulties. You know, when we're riding high and things are coming, everything's coming up roses, we tend to kind of get a little complacent. But when we find ourselves in difficult situations, that's where our faith really begins to, to blossom. Uh, that was true for God's people all through the ages. And one of the examples of that was John Bunyan, who in 1660 was thrown into jail for preaching the gospel. And for 12 years... He languished there in prison, cut off from the world and from other people. 
And yet, despite those very difficult times in his life, Bunyan, uh, if he would return to us today, he would say, I grew the most during those days of prison. You even look at the Apostle Paul. Uh, a lot of his best writings were the prison epistles. At least for me, I particularly enjoy those prison epistles. Uh, my favorite epistle is Philippians, and that was one of the uh, prison epistles. And for Bunyan, he would testify that as he spent that time languishing there in prison, that was a time of deepening his faith. Because God gave him faith equal to the needs that he had at that particular moment. And during that imprisonment, that's when Bunyan wrote one of the most influential books that were ever written, that spiritual classic, Pilgrim's Progress. I am almost ashamed to admit this to you, but it's probably only been within the last 20 years that I read that book, you know? And when I did, it was so enlightening, but it was just one of those things that uh, I was never much for allegories. Uh, uh, C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters don't interest me that much, and so Bunyan is an allegory, as, uh, Pilgrim's Progress is an allegory as well. And when I read it, it was like, wow, this is enlightening. This really helped me grow in my walk with the Lord. People who live surface lives, who face no great challenges, who follow no great purpose, who have no great burdens, rarely become rooted in the grace of God and develop a deep faith. The greatest problem for we as believers is that we say we place our faith in God, we believe that God is able, but then when it comes to putting that faith into practice, oftentimes we stumble and we retreat. And I think there's two possible extremes in this regard. One I'm going to call the paralysis of analysis. We cower in fear and inactivity because we're just waiting for one more sign from God. Yet yeah, this is where I want you to move ahead. We pray and we pray for direction. We keep studying God's word. We analyze the information, but we never quite get around to actually doing something of stepping out in faith and doing what we believe God would have us to do. I think today many Christians suffer from what has been called the McClellan syndrome. McClellan was a Civil War general who had distinguished himself as an uh, outstanding instructor for preparing men for battle. The problem was that he was so thorough, he was so intense that he was never quite sure, do I really, really have these men as fully prepared as I can to go into conflict? And that hesitancy eventually led Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, to remove him from his post because, you see, there comes a time that the training and the preparation have to give way to action. And there are believers that all too often spend all kinds of time questioning and, and agonizing, what would God want me to do? And we just need to do what God is leading us to do. Uh, R.G. Laterna, the uh, great uh, philanthropist, uh, would travel around uh, to college campuses and talk about following Christ. And, on one of those occasions, after he had given a speech at a college, uh, uh, college campus, why uh, one of his uh, uh, co-workers had come up to him and he said, you know, a, a lot of young, young people are struggling with the whole idea, of how do I know God's will for my life? And Laterna says, well, they got it all wrong. He said, they're wondering, what does God want them to do way out there somewhere? He said, you need to tell them the most important thing is, what does God want me to do right now at this moment? And let that, you know, for the future. And that's what we need to do when it comes to moving mountains, the mountains, the obstacles, the difficulties in our life. And so there's this paralysis of analysis, I, I call it. And the other end of that spectrum is those people that are always involved, they're always act active, and they're kind of like, you know, just chafing at the bit, to, and they'll jump in anywhere without even giving any thought, and without any prayer. They're just... They, they just say, well, I'm going to do something. And then sometimes that something is certainly not what God would, would have them to do. A supreme need that we as believers have is this, both individually as well as a church corporately, is that we need to be driven by that sense that that's what God wants us to do. And once we come to that, realize, that realization, this is where God is leading me, then you go ahead and you, you act on it. Uh, 
I, my attitude through life has been this way, that when I sense that God is leading in a certain direction, now's the time to move and not waffle and, and, and waver because God's not going to change his mind. If God is leading me today this way, I don't need to tomorrow go back and equivocate all over again. I need to just trust him. This is where God is leading me. And if he wants me to change, then he will make that very clear uh, to me. The problem most frequently is not our lack of faith. The problem is we know what we should do, but we don't do the action. We need to put feet to our conviction. Faith without action, the Apostle James says, is worthless. And so the moral of this story here, if you will, I believe is this, that we can face, we can conquer the difficulties in our life by exercising faith in God. The challenges that we face in life may seem like huge mountains that we cannot climb, rivers that we cannot cross, but our deeply rooted active faith in God is the strength from which we gain the uh, power and the uh, determination to confront these mountains, to move them out of the way so that we can be victorious for God. And so my challenge would be that as you look at the obstacles, as you look at the difficulties that you may be facing right now, God, through his strength and power, will help you through there and help those mountains to become little molehills and uh, yet you can continue to strive to follow him and live for his glory. Father in heaven, we thank you for the difficult statements that you have made because in those difficult statements, they challenge us that we would not be complacent, that we would not be casual in our faith walk with you. And so, Father, we pray that you would help each of us as we face various mountains, various difficulties in our life, that we would not despair, uh, we would not give in to fear, but that we would trust you and to know that you are with us wherever we go. And so, Lord, continue to guide us and help us to be all that you want us to be, so that through our walk and through our witness, people would see the beauty of Jesus in our lives, they would see the power of God at work in us as well, so that you in all things would receive the glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.